record. All right. And let me just double check one more thing. Uh, now this is recording me uh, vamping for a second, but um, Zoom is quite frustrating with not showing me I need to have the window of uh, speakers open so that I can let anyone else in if they join. But uh, here I am now. I'm going to talk to you. I want to talk about failures of uh, recognition in Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur. Um, and the I'm on a bit thin ice here, or uh, hot water, or however, whatever cliche you want to use, because I am uh, butting right up against the same topic or similar topic that Michaela is going to be talking about tomorrow, and I she will do it uh, better than me, um, because. Disguise and recognition is Michaela's specialty. So come back again tomorrow. I don't believe she's talking about Lamorte D'Arthur, um, though when uh, she has certainly expertise on Lamorte D'Arthur. And when I was first years ago thinking about this particular topic in Lamorte D'Arthur, she was one of the people that I went and talked to about it. So come back tomorrow to hear her talk. Um, I don't think I'm going to... Uh, overlap with her talk at all, but I'm going to be a little bit uh, careful about it. So uh, to start, I want to talk about Le Mort D'Arthur. Le Mort D'Arthur, in case you're unfamiliar, is a uh, full telling of the stories of King Arthur and his knights. And for various historical reasons, partly because it is just good, but partly because it was written immediately before the printing press was uh, popularized in England. And so it was the first Arthurian story to be printed and therefore widely distributed. This image I'm showing you is not the printed version, it's the manuscript, and I'll, I might talk about that in a sec. But because it was widely distributed and it tells a whole story um, in English, uh, Lamorte d'Arthur um, became in the 15th century, the uh, central text of Arthurian literature. So everything you think about as King Arthur probably comes either from Le Morte d'Arthur or from something that was inspired by Le Morte d'Arthur because Le Morte d'Arthur becomes this uh, literary historical bottleneck where everything that isn't in Le Morte d'Arthur gets mostly forgotten about in English. And everything that's in Le Morte d'Arthur is where we develop and write new versions. So everything um, comes back to Le Morte d'Arthur. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that happen in Le Morte d'Arthur in terms of recognition uh, and people recognizing each other when they see each other. Um, one of the things that happens all through Le Morte d'Arthur is there are knights who seem not to recognize each other, even though they probably should. So uh, I'm going to go through a few of them and talk a little bit about what is going on there. And I want to start with someone who isn't a knight. I want to start with Merlin. Merlin um, is the uh, enchanter, magician, advisor to Arthur. He's also the advisor to Arthur's father, Uther. Um, there's a whole story, speaking of recognition and uh, failing to recognize people, there's a whole story where Merlin disguises Uther so that Uther can sleep with uh, Duke Gorlois's uh, wife. Uh, and it's, it's worth talking about, but I don't really want to get into that part of Merlin disguising people. What I'm more interested for today is talking about these moments when Merlin appears and people don't recognize him. Merlin shows up in disguise several times early on in Le Morte d'Arthur. One example of this uh, I have here immediately after Arthur has uh, been given the sword from the lake. The Lady of the Lake gives Arthur a sword. And Arthur is wandering around with the sword, thinking about things. 
And right so came by King Arthur, Merlin, like a child of fourteen years of age, and saluted the king and asked him why he was so pensive. I may well be pensive, said the king, for I have seen the marvelous sight that ever I saw. That I know well, that know I well, said Merlin, as well as thyself and of all thy thoughts. But thou art a fool to take thought for it, for that, for that will not amend thee. Also I know what thou art, and who was thy father, and of whom thou were begotten, for King Uther is thy father, and begat thee on Egraine. That is false, said King Arthur. How shouldst thou know it? For thou art not so old of years to know my father. And by the way, Arthur, he didn't say he knew your father personally. He just said he knew who your father was. Although he did know Arthur, Arthur's father personally. So uh, anyway, in this encounter, Merlin is uh, disguised as a child. Um, Arthur, at this point in the story, this is early in the story, and it is not widely known yet who Arthur's father is. Uh, Arthur has been made king by drawing the sword from the stone, um, but his kingship is still in, de in debate. Um, and they go on, uh, Yes, said Merlin, I know it better than ye or any man living. I will not believe thee, said Arthur, and he was wroth with the child. So departed Merlin and came again in the likeness of an old man of fourscore year of age, whereof the king was passing glad, for he seemed to be right wise. Then said the old man, Why are you so sad? I may well be sad, answered Arthur, for many things. For right now was a child there, and he told me many things that meseemeth he should not know, for he was not of age to know my father. Uh, this isn't uh, my point or, or an important point at all, but I just want to Notice the word sad here is in Middle English just as likely to just mean serious as unhappy. So when he says, why are you so sad? It really means the same thing as why are you so pensive? Um, tangent. But uh, he knew many things uh, which he should not know. And uh, Uh, and Merlin goes on, yes, said the old man, uh, the child told you truth, and more he would have told you if you would have suffered him. For you have done a thing of late that God is displeased with you, for you have lain by your sister, and on her you've gotten a child that shall destroy you and all the knights of your realm. Uh, this, again, something worth spending some time on, but I have, there's, there's just too much. I had to make choices. So that uh, you've lain by your sister and on her have gotten a child is another example of a failure of recognition in Le Morte d'Arthur. Uh, Arthur does not know that uh, the woman he has slept with was his sister, his half-sister. Um, but he doesn't know, he doesn't recognize her. Uh, and it's another example of not knowing who people are being... Uh, a motif in Le Morte d'Arthur and something that causes a lot of trouble. And we could go into it, uh, I could go into it in a different context, but I made choices and I'm not going more into it now because I'm showing, I'm drawing attention here to Merlin still. What are ye, said Arthur, that tell me these tidings? Sir, I am Merlin, and I was he in the child's likeness. Ah, said the king, you are a marvelous man. This uh, interaction, this kind of interaction happens through Lamort D'Arthur more than once. This, ah, you're a marvelous man. Merlin does something. Everyone is amazed. It always reminds me of uh, in Arrested Development, if you have seen that TV show when the Jean Parmesan appears and they're all so amazed uh, because he's uh, so amazing to suddenly appear. If I was doing a TV show of uh, Arthurian things, I would have Merlin played by a different actor every time he appeared, like God on Joan of Arcadia, which is a pop culture reference I don't expect many people to make, but uh, many people to recognize. But uh, every time God appeared on that TV show, he was played by a different actor. Um, in any case, uh, this whole story of Merlin appearing 
the king doesn't recognize him because he seems to be a child. He comes back appearing to be an old man. The big, one of the big questions in this is what is even the point of this? Because Merlin, like we could call it a disguise, but it's not really a disguise. Merlin is not pretending to be someone else. He's not tricking anyone. Uh, he kind of hopes in this encounter where he pretends to be a child. He is in the likeness of a child of 14 and then in the likeness of an old man. Um, there's some disappointment in Merlin's aspect that Mer that Arthur doesn't listen to the child of 14. And there's also, it's not kept as a uh, mystery for long. Oh, sorry. It's not kept as a mystery for long. As soon as Arthur asks, who are you? I don't have that slide. I thought I did. Uh, it's a couple of slides back and I'm not going to go back. Um, as soon as Arthur asks, who are you? Merlin answers. I'm Merlin and I was Merlin. So this isn't really disguise in the sense of hiding his identity. Um, there's another aspect that I want to point out of this whole exchange, which is that in the manuscript, which you see a page from here, this is the same passage in the manuscript, another slight tangent, notice how some of the words are in red. This is a really interesting, uh, unique as far as I know, um, if not totally unique, uh, idi certainly idiosyncratic uh, aspect of the manuscript that Lamort D'Arthur of Lamort D'Arthur, it's written in only one manuscript. Um, there's a print version that was known for a long time, and that there's only one manuscript that we know of that predates the print version, and it's this one. Um, the did everyone lose audio? Uh, the manuscript has all the names in red, which is a really neat feature of the manuscript. So we see here at the top, Pelinor, Palamedes. Uh, Arthur, Merlin, down here, uh, Uther, Egrain, Arthur, Merlin, Arthur, Arthur. All through Lamort Arthur, all through the manuscript, names are in red, and the same grail, when it comes to the grail story, the grail is in red. And there's lots of uh, debate about what the point of that is. My opinion and it's not unique to me my opinion is it's a search mechanism you can open it's a big book you want to hear a story about uh lancelot you flip through you can find lancelot's name easily because it's in red but that's not the main point of why i'm showing you this page right now i want to show you right here see there's merlin in red and then below that there's an m crossed out with a squiggle this is a, another um, idiosyncratic feature of the Winchester manuscript that Merlin's name is often disguised. Merlin's name is often abbreviated like this. We can see it again here at the bottom of the page. Uh, that is, uh, and therewithal came Merlin and said, night, and therewithal came Merlin and said knight. And you notice the Merlin is abbreviated. You can notice the therewithal is also, that doesn't look like it says therewithal because that is an abbreviation. Sometimes scribes abbreviate words they expect you to recognize. That's an extremely common, unlike the red letters, um, that's an extremely common feature of uh, manuscripts, of medieval manuscripts. But in this manuscript, other names are hardly ever abbreviated like that, but Merlin's name is not, is quite frequently. So here's another example uh, that Merlin, that's it, I know I understand it's hard to read if you're not used to it, but that says that Merlin should go. Over here we have Merlin, or Merle said Merlin, and Merlin said, and every time Merlin 
not every time, but again and again, when Merlin is written, it's written as this M, this abbreviated M. We have Merlin, 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 always as this uh, M instead of um, fully written out. And it's hard, again, to know exactly why that might be. On one hand, Merlin's uh, appearance, uh, Merlin's tendency to uh, appear in disguise uh, might just be a plot, like a concession to the plot. Merlin is tricky in magic. Merlin does magic things. And one of the reasons why his uh, name is hidden as an M or is abbreviated as an M there's lots of conjecture. No one really knows for sure, but we think maybe uh, it, 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 some of the reasons, maybe it's like a taboo. It's like you don't want to mention dangerous uh, magic things. That one seems unlikely to me. Um, and most people don't think that either. But maybe it's an indication to the reader that Merlin is disgu in disguise at this moment. And it does seem to happen mostly when Merlin is in disguise or when Merlin appears suddenly and no one expects him to be there, or when the people around don't recognize Merlin for who he is, even if he's not in disguise. So that M is like a marker to us reading Merlin's in disguise right now. Um, on the, So that's a, a reason for the M, and maybe all of that is just about Merlin has disguises. Merlin can transform himself. Merlin can appear in one face or another because Merlin is tricky and magic and that the plot of the story. On the other hand, maybe there's a thematic meaning. Maybe um, there is something deeper to why people keep not recognizing Merlin when he shows up. Why Merlin keeps appearing in disguises, keeps appearing in ways that people don't recognize. Maybe that actually means something in the story. Uh, enter Balin. Balin is one of the early knights in the story. He uh, has a very self-contained story, so he is not one of the knights that people tend to remember and think of when you think of Arthurian knights because it's a completely self-contained story and then he doesn't appear anywhere else. But Balin, um, at one point in his story, I'm going to tell you a little more about him, but at one point in his story that is relevant to this conversation right now is uh, Balin encounters Merlin in disguise. Merlin says, uh, ba Balin says, who are you? Merlin says, I won't tell you, but I can tell you what you are doing. I can tell you why you Rai, are riding where you are. You are going to meet with King Ryons, but it will not avail you without my counsel. Ah, said Balin, you are Merlin. Balin recognizes Merlin because of what Merlin says and does. Balin does what Merlin wishes Arthur had been able to do, which is no matter what Merlin looks like, Balin recognizes Merlin by his actions. Merlin knows things about Balin. Balin says, must be Merlin. Balin uh, will keep that in our mind and come back to it again. But a little bit about Balin. Balin is uh, an, separate from Arthur's court. So he is a knight who takes up a whole section of the story, but it is ambiguous whether we could really call him a King Arthur's knight. He's not one of the knights of the round table. He's not uh, of Arthur's court. His, his primary fealty is not to Arthur. His story begins, in fact, uh, with uh, a damsel comes to Arthur's court and she has a sword girded around her waist that no one can pull out of the scabbard. And she says, only one who uh, has no treachery or villainy and is of no, of uh, um, good, uh, uh, of worship with no treachery or villainy will be able to pull this sword out. And then we have this section I'm showing you here. It befell at that time that there was a poor knight who had been prisoner for half a year for slaying of a knight that was cousin unto King Arthur. And that na knight's name was Balin. 
and there's uh, more stuff about him. But the thing that we I want to draw attention to is that Balin here is described as a poor knight. He's named Balin. He's poor and poorly arrayed. He's in prison. Nobody, uh, he's not one of Arthur's knights. And uh, when the damsel comes, she says that only a knight with no worship, uh, an, only a knight uh, who is worthy and without villainy or treachery will be able to pull out the sword. And when she sees him, he says, let me try to pull out the sword. Um, she looks at him and because his clothes are ratty, his poor arraignment, he th she thought he can't possibly be a knight of no worship without villainy or treachery. Um, incidentally, before I go on, this damsel appears with a sword around her waist that no one can pull out except someone who meets a certain condition. And Arthur is like, ooh, ooh, let me do it. I'm good at this. Because it is soon after Arthur has been made king and Arthur pulled the sword out of, out of the stone to become king. And Arthur thinks of pulling swords out of things as like totally his kind of thing to do. Uh, and when he can't do it, he tries pulling really hard. And she's like, if, 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 it's not like strength that's going to do this, man. Um, anyway, she thinks that Balin won't be able to do it because he looks poor. And Balin says, worthiness and good takis. Takis is uh, Middle English for characteristics, so good traits. Um, worthiness and good traits and also good deeds is not only an arraignment, but manhood and worship is hid within a man's person, and many a worshipful knight is not known unto all people. This comes to the point that I'm driving at all the way until now, the point of Balin's story and also the point I think of Merlin's uh, frequent disguises is this is all about knowing friend from foe. This is all about how do you recognize who your friends are? How do you recognize who someone is? And this theme or this idea of recognizing friend from foe continues here because after Balin pulls the sword out and it's very impressive and then he wears it and people say don't wear the uh um the lady says the damsel says give me the sword back and uh Balin says no I'm not going to give you the sword back I'm going to wear two swords forever now um and then uh another lady comes into the court and she's the lady of the lake who has the one who gave Arthur his sword and Arthur says I forgot to ask you what my sword's name and she says it's Excalibur um, and she says, I want a, in exchange for the sword, I gave, I did something for you. I want something from you. I want the head of the knight who won the sword or else the head of the damsel that brought the sword. Uh, the head, the knight who, uh, drew the sword is Balin. And Balin, uh, when he hears this, he says to her, the Lady of the Lake, he says, evil be you found, you would have my head and therefore you shall lose yours. And with his sword, he lightly smote off her head right before King Arthur. This is uh, one of the uh, stories of King Arthur that people generally don't remember. The Lady of the Lake who gave Arthur Excalibur is beheaded pretty soon afterwards. But in any case, the this whole exchange uh, is hard to keep track of the plot of, but we have Balin, we have a damsel with a sword who shows up, Balin draws the sword from the damsel of the sword, and then the Lady of the Lake shows up. And the Lady of the Lake, who gave Arthur Excalibur, hates and wants as a reward for Excalibur, she wants to kill either Balin or the damsel with the sword, either one of them. Balin, not liking this, beheads the Lady of the Lake, who dies. Merlin then appears. He says, you shouldn't listen to the damsel with the sword. That sword's no good. I don't trust her. But Balin, I, he praises, Balin is good. We should believe Balin. Um, Arthur, meanwhile, he owed the Lady of the Lake, so he is very upset that Balin has beheaded her. 
He wanted to impress the damsel with the sword, and for both of those reasons, he is now angry with Balin, and he banishes Balin, who just did this miraculous thing of drawing the sword from the the uh, girdle, which proved supposedly that he's without treachery. But he also just beheaded the Lady of the Lake, who was under Arthur's protection. Um, the dam, the Lady of the Lake, remember, wanted to kill Balin and the Damsel with the Sword, and the Damsel with the Sword gave the sword to Balin, but maybe it's a cursed sword. Merlin thinks it's a cursed sword. All of this back and forth and these arrows aren't really about recognizing people, except in the deeper sense of in this whole exchange, it is not obvious who's the good guy. And even apart from like good and evil, if we want to be more uh, pragmatic and mercenary about it, it's not obvious who is on whose side. Where are the allegiances in this whole exchange? It's not obvious even when you've read it many times. And Balin, as a character, continues to be this character who uh, it's not clear where his allegiances lie. He wants to impress King Arthur and be uh, uh, a knight of King Arthur, but Arthur, he keeps making Arthur mad. Um, he wears the, he takes the second sword. He wears both swords. And for a lot of his story, Balin calls himself the knight with the two swords, which symbolically is like uh, the knight with two masters or the knight with two purposes, right? He's a split identity. He also happens to be have a, a brother, Balin and Balin, uh, and they're, you know, you can recognize their names are almost the same. And Balin and Balin and Balin are also, uh, if we know them for any reason, you know, Bal Balin, Balin and Balin are the most famous antagonistic brothers in Lamort Darthur. Um, and here I have another example of mistaken identity and failure of recognition in Lamort Darthur in with the specific case of Balin and Balin. Um, Balin has a whole bunch of adventures, including at one point fighting an invisible knight, which is also about not being able to recognize people. Um, and then he comes to an island and he's told uh, there's a custom in this island that you have to fight with a knight. He says that's an unhappy custom that a knight may not pass this way, but if he joust, you shall not have ado, but with one knight, said the lady. Well, said Balin. Since I shall, thereto I am ready. But travailing men are oft weary, and their horses too. But though my horse be weary, my heart is not weary. I should be fain there, but I should be fain there my death should be. Which, uh, a little hard to parse, but in other words, I'm going to meet my fate where I meet my fate. If I'm going to die there, I'm going to be there. Sir, uh, there are typos. I copied this, uh, looking at my copy of Limor Darthur and touch typing. So I apologize for the typos, uh, which you probably, um, some of which you won't even notice because the spelling is non-standard. Some of those, there shouldn't be an F before that B. That is just a typo. Sir, said the knight, said a knight to Balin, methinketh your shield is not good. I will lend you a bigger. Thereof I pray you. And so he took the shield that was unknown he, Balin, took the shield that was unknown and left his own, and so rode in unto the land, unto the island, and put him and his horse in a great boot. And when he came to the other side, he met with a damsel, and she said, O oh, knight Balin, why have you left your own shield? Alas, you have put yourself in great danger, for by your shield you should have been known. This, um, by the way, I hope is not too hard to follow why that might be that changing his shield makes it hard to recognize him. These are 15th century uh, armor. Lamort d'Arthur is written in the 15th century. Who knows when it is set? But Mallory certainly and his readers would have been imagining this kind of armor. You can see this 15th century armor. You're wearing a helmet. 
it is hard to recognize you. You could never even tell by looking at this that this is Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup from the Powerpuff Girls underneath this armor. So the uh, the damsel that says, why did you leave your shield? And if we look back a little bit, uh, even a couple of lines, why did he leave his shield? Because a knight who Balin thought was there to help him said, I think your shield is not good. And so Balin takes off his shield that's unknown and and leaves takes the shield that's unknown and leaves his own. This is another example, a uh, more a less literal example of Balin not knowing who his friends are. So Balin, wearing a shield that's unrecognizable, goes and he fights uh, the and out of the island castle comes a knight and his horse is is all in red and he himself of the same color. And when this knight in red beheld Balin. He thought it was his brother Balin because of his two swords. But because he knew not his shield, he deemed it was not he. And so they adventured their spears and came marvelously fast together and they fought uh, and they skimmed down to the bottom. After they fight, they, they hurt each other very badly. And at the last, Balin, the younger brother, withdrew him a little and laid him down. Then said Balin le Sauvage, what knight art thou? For or now I never knew no knight that matched me. My name is, he said, Balin, brother unto the good knight Balin. At this point, alas, said Balin, that ever I should see this day, and he fell it backward in a spoon. And then Balin yield on all four feet and hands and put off the helm of his brother that took it off, the helm of his brother, that, and might not know him by his visage. It was so full hewn and bled. But when he, Balin, when Balin awoke, he said, O Balin, my brother, thou hast slain me and I thee, wherefore all the wide world shall speak of us both. This whole story, the two brothers not recognizing each other, fight to the death, uh, is again all about like, they, they don't recognize each other because of the shield thing, because they're wearing helmets. But then we have this line that even after ba Balin takes off Balin's helmet, he still doesn't recognize him when he sees his face. His face is so hewn and bloody, like there's a re there's always a reason, but even after he takes off the helmet, he still can't recognize him until he speaks. Um, because again, this is all about this motif and theme through Lamort d'Arthur and through all kinds of um, Arthurian stories that come from and that lead to Lamort d'Arthur, this theme of not knowing friend from foe. It's vital to know who your friends are when you are a knight, when you are a king, when you are making a, uh, a court or a nation. And they keep being bad at it in this book. And Balin and Balin, uh, their story is one of the, the prototypes that then gets followed through all the rest of the book. It happens pretty early. And other things happen that should remind us of Balin and Balin not knowing each other, not recognizing each other. There's a whole story of Tristram that I would really like to go into, but I, thinking it, about it as I was making this uh, talk, I thought... You know, I, I'll be here all day if I talk about everything I want to. So I'm going to just skim through Tristram extremely quickly, although he is a really interesting story. Tristram, uh, the, the one thing I will say about Tristram is he goes around a lot in disguise. There's a whole story at the start of his section of Lamont d'Arthur where he goes in disguise uh, to uh, to Ireland. And while in Ireland, to be in disguise, he changes his name from Tristram to Tramtrist, uh, which is a completely plausible disguise that works. It is the most, uh, uh, it's one of the most transparent disguises you can imagine, um, but it completely works and nobody recognizes him uh, when he calls himself Tramtrist. There are other places in Tristram's story where he's in disguise, and there's one that I would like to talk about but I just had to decide not to for the sake of other things where he meets uh 
Isolde's maid servant, and she recognizes his horse, but she re doesn't recognize him. Although at that point, depending on your math, uh, they've known each other for something like 20 years. But she doesn't recognize him. He's not wearing a helmet. She doesn't recognize him. She only recognizes his horse. Um, having said that, I want to skim past that to talk about something that I want to spend more time looking at in detail, and that is Sir Gareth. Gareth of Orkney is one of the brothers of Gawain, which makes him a nephew of King Arthur, and he uh, his story is also self-contained in Lemorst Arthur. It, you know, it's one of these stories that could lift right out, um, but is one of the most popular sections of Lemorst Darthur has always been. Uh, it is almost as it's almost uh, like a modern novel in how it develops character uh, in really interesting ways. So Sir Gareth appears. the The story goes that uh, Arthur is having a feast, and a uh, mysterious knight appears, um, and Arthur says. Uh, have me he the the knight appears and says all i'm asking for you from you is that you give me food and drink and let me stay here for a year and i'm not asking anything else although arthur has said that he will grant anyone a boon who appears during this feast and does something miraculous which apparently uh going i mean apparently gareth being very tall is miraculous enough to arthur for it to count so he, he comes and he says, all I want is food and drink. And well, said the king, you shall have meat and drink enough. I never forbade it, my friend or my foe. But what is your name, I would know? Sir, I cannot tell you. That is a marvel, said the king, that you don't know your name. And you are one of the goodliest young men that ever I saw. This seems like a really strange exchange because why does Arthur assume that Gareth doesn't know his name? Gareth says, I can't tell you my name. And Arthur's like, he doesn't even know his name. Um, and it's a strange reaction from Arthur. But the reason for it is because Gawain, because Gareth, I keep calling him Gawain. He's not Gawain. It's because Gareth falls under, Gareth's story falls under a trope called the fair unknown that uh, there are a number of fair unknown stories. Here are a few of them. Um, and uh, there's uh, Le Bel and Canoe, uh, Le Bel and Canoe, Le Beau's Des Canoe, uh, both literally mean the fair unknown. So those, that's the first one is in, uh, French and Lobos Descanus is in uh is like English, but uh Frank of size Anglo Normany, it's not Anglo Norman exactly, but Anglo Normanish uh English. And they both literally mean the fair unknown. That's where we get that name. Um and there are other fair unknown stories in uh in some of them, like in Lobos Descanus, when the unknown knight appears. Uh, he wants to be made a knight. Arthur says, uh, what is your name? And the un fair unknown says, I don't know what my name is. So sometimes in the trope, the fair unknown doesn't know his own name. Although, Gar so Gareth knows his name, but Arthur, it seems like, has read fair unknown stories and knows that he's in one. He recognizes the kind of story he's in, he assumes that Gareth doesn't know his name. Um, and I'll, But although Ner Gareth knows his name, no one else knows his name. So he is a fair unknown, fair in the sense that he is extremely attractive. Um, and the name that they give him is Beaumains, which means pretty hands. Uh, and he, uh, here we can see again from the manuscript, Sir Gareth, tale of Orkney that was called Beaumains by Sir Kay. That's that bottom line and a half. So his name is Beaumains. Uh, Kay names him Beaumains for most of his story. Nobody knows that he's Sir Gareth of Orkney. 
The Tale of Sir Gareth of Orkney has no known source, direct source. It is a lot like a lot of other fair unknown stories, but as far as we know, Mallory didn't have a direct source. It is uh, interesting that um, one of the other well-known fair unknown stories is Le Cote Maltaillé, and uh, Le Cote Maltaillé uh, is in Mallory. So uh, Le Cote Maltaillé, one of the fair unknown stories, is in Mallory. It technically, I mean, it is referenced here in the story of Sir Gawain, but it doesn't actually happen in Mallory until after this. Um, in any case, this is it's uh, Lancelot tells Kay not to give Beaumain's a uh, mocking nickname because he cal called Le Cote Maltier a bad nickname and it turned out badly for him. And Kay's like, yeah, but what are the chances that would ever happen twice? Um, so uh, the fair and known story is a trope, and this trope of the fair and known, known story that Gawain, that Gareth follows largely is some knight comes to the court, no one knows who he is, and he proves himself. And the details change. Um, what's common in the Pharaoh known story is no one recognizes the knight. He often ends up being someone important. He always ends up being uh, of noble lineage. And there's basically two alternative ways of reading and understanding what is going on in the pharaoh unknown story thematically one is that class is a smoke screen worthiness comes from within it's exactly what balan says worthiness and good traits and good deeds aren't an arraignment but manhood and worship is hid within a man's person so the fair unknown comes uh everyone wants to know who who do you know who's your connection and what is the story is about is it doesn't matter who he knows. It doesn't matter where he comes from. It matters what he does. Class, uh, lineage, these are smoke screens, and what really matters is what you do. An alternative way of reading the fair unknown story is the exact opposite. Class stratification is natural. Low, noble lineage will out that uh, you may not know that the fair unknown is of noble birth, but it always comes out that he is. Um, so there's a story of uh, Sir Tor. I'm going to speed through this because I'm looking at the time. But uh, in the Fair Unknown story, maybe we can read it and think character and deeds are evidence of class. You can tell someone's class by the kinds of things they do. So even in the story of uh, Sir Balin, Balin says lots of people don't seem like don't have money, don't seem great, but they actually are noble. Uh, he doesn't actually mean um, because of what they do, regardless of their lineage and birth, he means what they do proves what their lineage and birth is. Um, in Sir Gareth of Orkney, the story, we kind of see both ideas. We see the idea that it doesn't matter where uh, Gareth comes from or who he is or what his real name is. It just matters what he does. Um, we also see the idea that lineage and blood and birth is obvious in a person and they can't really hide it. And here at the end of the story of Sir Gareth, when or near the middle actually, but when Gareth tells his name to Lancelot, he says, my name is Sir Gareth, brother unto Sir Gawain, of father's side and mother's side. And Lancelot says, ah, sir, I am more gladder of you than I was, for ever me thought you should be of great blood, and that you came to the court neither for meat nor drink. Lancelot thinks he can detect Gareth's blood just by looking at him, and it turns out he's right. It turns out you look at Gareth, you see that he's tall and good on a horse and good at fighting. He must have noble blood. And the story turns out to be that that is true. Um, likewise, uh, Gareth fights all these knights. I'm going to, again, 
not stop too much on this because I'm seeing the time slip away from me. Um, he fights all these knights and the he defeats the Black Knight. And the Black Knight says, even if he's not born of worship born, he's a full likely person, likely to be a strong knight. His body is evidence of his strength. And uh, later Gareth says to the Black Knight, I'm of higher lineage than you and I'll prove it on your body. Let's have a fight. If I win, it'll prove I'm a gentleman born because his body that's evidence of his strength is also evidence of his lineage, which is back to blood. Blood, his uh, identity is tied to his family, is tied to his blood, and that's proven in his body and that's how the things that he does proves who he is, not so much the things he, as he does creates who he is. So in uh, the story of Sir Gareth, he defeats the Black Knight, he defeats a Green Knight, he defeats a Red Knight. At that point, the lady that's following him around, who wasn't impressed with him at first, says like, okay, he's probably pretty good because he keeps defeating these uh, knights. And she apologizes for being mean to him for so long. Um, I, she thought, she says, that you he was just a kitchen knight because he worked in the kitchen, he smelled like the kitchen, he didn't know that uh, she didn't know that he was a gentleman, but now he's done such things that she starts to trust him a little. And he says, uh, uh, oh, and she says, although I keep insulting you, you've always been courteous to me. And that came never but of gentle blood. In other words, she says, it proves to me not that you defeated all these knights, but that you defeated knights and I said mean things to you, but you were always polite back to me. And that was proof. That's the real proof that you have gentle blood. And once again, like, the, the text explicitly seems to be telling us that this is the evidence of his lineage and his blood and his background and his class uh, is his behavior. But in the Mort d'Arthur, there are plenty of knights of gentle blood who don't suffer insults courteously. Uh, and since knight is a class, all knights are of gentle blood to some degree. This is one of the things that is um, easy to forget if you are reading, uh, if you're reading casually, um, a knight on horseback is always a gentleman by class. You can't be a knight just because you have a horse and a sword both because horses and armor and swords are expensive, but also because knight isn't just a job, it's a class. So all knights are of gentle blood and some knights are bad guys. Some knights are rude and uncourteous. They also have gentle blood. So how does Gareth behaving courteously prove that he has gentle blood at all? And what Beaumain says, what Gareth says in response is a knight may little do that may not suffer a gentlewoman. In other words, if I couldn't take you if I couldn't take your insults, I would be pretty worthless as a knight. Um, but I think more interestingly, um, oh, and, and he says, for whatsoever you said, I took none heed to your words, like sticks and stones may break my bones. But, uh, and the more that angered me, the more, uh, the more you, what you said angered me, the more I wrecked out my wrath on, uh, appropriate targets. He directs his violence towards appropriate targets instead of towards the woman who is insulting him. He internalize, I, he takes that, it fuels his anger, and then he attacks his uh, the other knights instead of the lady who's insulting him. But more interestingly, I think, is this. At the end of Gareth's speech to, uh, to the lady, Lynette, saying all this stuff, then he says, whether that I be a gentleman born or not, I let you know, fair damsel, I have done you a gentleman's service. Here we have the opposite of this idea that uh, his behavior proves that he's a gentleman. He says, now, it doesn't matter whether I'm a gentleman, I've done gentlemanly things. I've done you a gentleman's service. What I've done is what matters, not my lineage. This comes back again to, or this comes back around when all his uh, C 
secrets come out and people ask, like, why did you go through all of this? Why did you come here in disguise? Uh, he is Beaumain's, is Gareth, is Gawain's younger brother, is Arthur's nephew. He could have come to Arthur's court and said, I'm Sir Gareth, or I'm Gareth, knight me. And they would have knighted him and he would have been Sir Gareth and he would have had, you know, none of this... Uh, inconvenienced but he says all that i did i did it to prove my friends the point of going incognito is finding out who your friends are both because it uh friendship that gareth values this friendship that takes him as he is on his own grounds he wants to be friends with people who value him as an individual not just because of who his brother is but also it allows him to judge other people's character. So how do they treat an unknown knight? And also it allows him to um, like prove his friends in the opposite direction, not only uh, discover who his friends are, but also prove them in the sense of um, deserve them. So he, has do he does things so that when he has friends, people will want to be his friend based on what he has done rather than on who they know him to be, his uh, family. Um, he, there are other examples of uh, people see him and they think truly he's of noble blood, like the princess and the pea. Uh, he can, they can tell that he is uh, of noble blood because of how he acts. Um, I'm, I'm going through this. Uh, Blood, though, is not just about his background, it's also about factionalism. So um, he wants to know who his friends are. Uh, once he has revealed himself to most people, he still doesn't reveal himself to the Lady Leoness, who in his story, he... Um, My light is, is flashing. Stop that. <laughs> I'm going to have to turn that off. Um, in his story, he... Uh, it's, it's not important. He he, decide, he uh, falls in love with and wants to marry the Dame Lynette's sister, Leoness. And her brother says that until he knows who Gareth's name is and what kindred he comes, uh, he will never be happy and he can never, he'll never approve of the marriage. That is partly the same kind of um, who you are is your lineage. We, you know, we need to know whether he's really noble stuff that we talked about already. But when it comes to marriage, there's another uh, subtext, which is that marriage is a political alliance. So that marrying uh, Leoness, marrying some guy who we don't know who it is does not create a political alliance, but marrying the son of uh, Arthur, Ar Arthur's sister's son, marrying King Arthur's nephew, will create a political alliance for them and will create, uh, will unite factions who um, strengthen the realm and strengthen each other. And so there's a, a sense not... Uh, there's a, there's a pragmatic and practical sense to knowing who Gareth is before we allow him to get married. But anyway, um, when uh, the Queen of Orkney, uh, Gareth's mother, comes to... While, while uh, Gareth is out having his adventures, the Queen of Orkney... Uh, Morgaus, his mother, comes to visit Camelot, and when she comes, she asks, what have you done with my young son, Gareth? He's been here for 12 months. And Gawain says, I did not know him. He was his brother, shows up to court, and Gawain doesn't recognize him because there's a, we can kind of make up rational understand rational explanations like Gawain has been away at court for a really long time Gareth was young when he left 
He's grown up a lot. Gwen hasn't been home to visit. He doesn't recognize his grown up brother. Um, but there's a more profound thematic reason that Gwen doesn't recognize his friends and allies when he sees him them. Gwen doesn't know who his friends are. Um, and uh, the Queen of Orkney says, you made him a kitchen knave, which is a shame to all of you. Make, because not recognizing him and not treating him as he deserves based on his class, but also based on his family, it's a shame on Arthur and on Gawain, who are not just failing to recognize someone who is of their class, but they're failing to recognize someone who is in their family, and family is constitutive of identity. So you should know who he is, because who he is is also who you are. And when you diminish him, you diminish your family, and it's a shame to all of you. You make him a kitchen knight, you make your family kitchen knaves, uh, because family is constitutive of identity. Having said that, even after his identity is known, Gareth de-emphasizes his family. So after everybody knows who Gareth is, uh, we have this section, Lord, the great cheer that Sir Lancelot made of Gareth and he did of him, for there was never no knight that Sir Gareth loved so well as he did Sir Lancelot. And ever for the most part, he would be in Sir Lancelot's company. For ever after Sir Gareth had espied Sir Gawain's conditions, he withdrew himself from his brother Sir Gawain's fellowship. For he was ever vengeable, and where he hated, he would be avenged with murder, and that hated Sir Gareth. Gareth, by uh, hiding his identity, by failing to be, re by arranging things so that he isn't recognized by Sir Gawain, Gareth is able to see Sir Gawain and recognize him. He espies his conditions. He knows how Gawain acts now. And he, uh, so Gareth recognizes Sir Gawain in a way that Gawain didn't ever recognize Sir Gareth. This is again, I mentioned like factionalism is one of the things about identity. We have not just families and allegiances and alliances, we have political factions. And by the end of this story, as Gareth in disguise travels around, he keeps defeating knights. And when he defeats them, he makes them promise to swear allegiance to him. So that by the beginning of this story, Gareth has no... Um, prestige or power or allegiances other than the ones that belong to Gawain first because Gawain as the oldest brother is the head of the family in I guess Lot his father is really the head of the family but we don't hear a lot about Lot after he by this point in the story we hear a lot earlier not important um, but Gareth has nothing that doesn't belong to Gawain first at the beginning of his story but as he travels through the story, he defeats all these knights and he keeps uh, gaining their allegiances. And by the end of his story, Gareth is the lord of the green knight and all his knights, the red knight and his knights, the Persiant of Ind and his knights, um, Sir Ironside and his knights, the Duke de la Rouse and his knights. Uh, there are numbers of knights listed, um, which means that Gwen is lord of 495 knights at least five of which get sort of names, like Green Knight, the Red Knight, aren't exactly names, but we know five of their names. We know he's Lord of at least 495 knights. Um, that is, he is Lord of his own faction at this point. He is uh, no longer dependent on Gawain for his identity. And the way that feudalism works, right, is that there's Sir Gareth, um, under he pledges fealty to Lancelot, who has fealty to Arthur, and Gareth beneath him has Sir Ironside, for example, who has 300 knights. So all those 300 knights are actually being added to Arthur's faction because Gawain is under Lancelot, is under Arthur. That's how, like, the mechanism of feudalism, right? So Gareth's successes lead to Arthur's successes, uh, but no longer through 
through Gawain, it's through Lancelot instead. Um, even after all of this, his identity has come to light. There's another tournament, and then uh, Sir Gawain, Sir Gareth, tells all the people, Dame Leoness and the Red Knight of the Red Land, and Sir Perseant and his brethren and Sir Grigamore and everyone, not to tell anyone his name because even after all of this has come to light, he's achieved all these political ends, he's achieved his kind of self-actualization, he still is hiding his identity to fight in a tournament unknown because there's another thing that we haven't really talked about that matters in all of this in the same way that uh, Merlin, part of the reason he's in disguise is all this thematic reason, but part of it is just like magic. There's also a sense that fighting incognito is a mechanism by which ostensible allies can fight each other. Like in a superhero comic where Captain America can fight Thor, they hide their identities as a reason, as an excuse to fight each other so that they can find out who is stronger. Which brings us to Lancelot, because Lancelot does that kind of thing a lot, <laughs> Lance, a lot. Um, there's, and I don't want to um, belabor it by bringing up all the examples, but I'll just tell you, this is something Lancelot does all the time. Lancelot always, when he comes to a tournament or a battle, wants to be on the weaker side because there's no glory in being on the stronger side. So he ends up fighting against his allies fairly often because he fights in disguise. He puts on some armor that makes him unrecognizable. He fights against Arthur and then he's like, oh, it was me all along. And everyone's like, wow, you're so amazing. One of the most memorable examples of Lancelot being incognito uh, is another one that I'm going to skate by fairly quickly to get to something more important but uh there's a very memorable and frankly hilarious uh episode where lancelot meets sir Kay doing battle against three knights and lancelot fights them all off and uh they go to bed and while Kay is sleeping lancelot wakes up early takes Kay's armor and shield and armed him and he went to the stable and uh saddled his horse, not addled his horse, missing S, saddled his horse and took his leave of his host, that missing H, uh, should not be missing, uh, that, sorry, that is to say, that missing H isn't my fault, <laughs> took leave of his host and departed, and soon after arose Sir Kay and missed Sir Lancelot, and then he espied that he had his armor and his horse. Now, by my faith, I know well that he will grieve some of the court of King Arthur, for on him knights will be bold and deem that it is I, and that will beguile them. And because of his armor and shield, I am sure I shall ride in peace. And soon Sir Kay departed and thanked his host. Lancelot plays an old, the old switcheroo with Kay's armor. He rides around in Kay's armor, picking fights. Uh, he thinks that uh, people won't recognize him under the armor. They'll think that he is Sir Kay. Remember, you can't tell who people are under their armor. And it turns out Lancelot is right again. Uh, people pick fights with Kay thinking that he's an easy mark, but it turns out it's Lancelot under the armor and Kay rides safely. No one thinking that it is uh, Kay because they don't want to fight Lancelot, who famously is strong and tough. This is partly a whole story, like it's partly just a funny story. It's partly a story about uh, Lancelot, you know, being nice to someone who is kind of a jerk to him, which is Sir Kay. Um, it's partly the story about Lancelot likes to fight. And so people don't want to fight Lancelot because he's too strong and he likes fighting. So he goes as Sir Kay, so people will pick a fight with him. Um, this tendency of Lancelot's causes trouble sometimes. And I'm going to bring us to an end with another example of Lancelot liking to fight. Lancelot picks fights. He likes to be on the weaker side. And he has the problem of the strongest knight in the world if no one ever wants to fight him. So he often tries to go in disguise. But one of the 
most poignant moments of uh, failure to recognize in Lancelot's story is one where Lancelot is the one who fails to recognize others. Lancelot, uh, you may know, you probably do know, Lancelot uh, is um, has, has, having an affair with Guinevere, or in Mallory, we never, we're, until the last minute, we don't quite know that he's having an affair with Guinevere. He's presumed to be having an affair with Guinevere, um, and when they are caught, Guinevere is captured, Lancelot rides off, and Guinevere is going to be burned at the stake for treachery, for betraying the king. And Lancelot, she's guarded by all these other knights, and uh, particularly um, Geharis and Gareth. Gareth, who we met earlier, and his older brother Geharis, who does not do very much in all of Le Mort d'Arthur, they're ordered by the king to protect or to guard Guinevere because they all expect that Lancelot is going to come riding in to save the day. And uh, as he does, Lancelot does come riding in to save the day. And when he comes in rushing and hurling as he thrang here and there, it's misfortune to him to slay Sir Geharis and Sir Gareth, the noble knight, for they were unarmed and unawares. They, uh, uh, because the king tells Gareth, Gaharis and Gareth that they have to guard Guinevere, they do, but they say, I'm not going to be armed against Lancelot because he's my friend. And so they go with no armor. And as the French book saith, Sir Lancelot smote Sir Gaharis and Sir Gareth upon the brain pans, where throw they were slain in the field. Howbeit, in very truth, Sir Lancelot saw them not. And so were they found dead among the thicket of the press. The text, again, explicitly tells us that Lancelot doesn't see them. Lancelot, uh, they aren't wearing helmets. It, this um, claim earlier, what I've said more than once, that like, there's a plot reason why there's like a, a logical plot reason why you can't necessarily recognize a knight when you see him. They're wearing a helmet. But Gareth and Gaharis aren't wearing helmets, and Lancelot still kills them both and claims that he doesn't know it's them. And some critics uh, have argued pretty um, emphatically that Lancelot wouldn't have been able to recognize them necessarily because the helmet doesn't just stop. Uh, him from being seen, it really limits his field of vision. Uh, Gawain, however, does not buy this story. Gawain uh, refuses to accept uh, Lancelot's apology, refuses to make peace with Lancelot, refuses to believe that such a good knight as Lancelot would be unable to prevent himself from killing people around him. Um, and we part, and the plot of Le Mort d'Arthur ends with, like, Mordred often gets the blame for uh, rebelling against Arthur, but Mordred rebels against Arthur, and that's the end of, uh, spoiler alert, that's the end of Le Mort d'Arthur, Mordred rebels, Mordred and Arthur kill each other, and Arthur's whole court ends. But the reason Mordred can do as well as he does is because Arthur has to leave his court to fight against Lancelot. And the reason Arthur has to leave to fight Lancelot, Arthur is willing to forgive Lancelot or at least let bygones be bygones, but Gawain is not willing. Gawain will not stop. Gawain will not forgive Lancelot because Lancelot killed Gareth. So at the heart of the end of Camelot is this uh, both literal, not recognizing who your friends are, like maybe Lancelot just didn't see Gareth, and also this more profound thematic sense that uh, neither Lancelot nor Gawain nor Arthur know who their friends are. And so they treat each other like enemies, um, and it's the failure to recognize friends where they see them that brings about the whole failure of 
the Arthurian court and Camelot and the, the flower of chivalry, which brings us all the way back to the beginning. That why doesn't Arthur ever recognize Merlin in disguise? What is the point of Merlin in disguise? Is it's laying this thematic thread that the whole story of Arthur hinges on the king being able to recognize his friends when he sees them. And for all his many uh, virtues, Arthur is not able to recognize his friends. Are there any questions? I will take uh, questions for a little bit. Um, thank you so very much for uh, listening to me. <laughs> um, if you have, I'm going to talk a little bit while you're gathering thoughts, assuming that you uh, need a second to gather, because most of the time people do. Um, if you think of a question uh, in half an hour, uh, feel free to ask it on the Discord, or this talk will be repeated in a couple of hours, whatever, I think four hours from when it started. Um, and you can feel very free to jump in right at the end, and there will be another live Q&A, and I'll answer questions again then. Is Arthur daft, or does he have bad ads eyesight? This is the whole, like, the whole thing that uh, led to this talk, is it's not just Arthur. It is, it's, um, the biggest example that I gave you in this talk is Gareth, and this is where, like, Ah, uh, it broke my heart to have to decide because maybe I should never have skipped Tristram because there are lots of examples of Tristram. People don't recognize him when they really should. And it's not just Arthur. It's uh, all kinds of knights who should be able to recognize him. Um, and we can, I think, come up with internal story reasons like i sometimes joke maybe they've all just had so many concussions that they have face blindness um but there's also a deeper uh thematic reason that um being able to to know your friends when you see them is harder than it sounds and so we literalize that by having them be like actually unable to recognize each other's faces but if we think of Balin and Balin as an example, as the like uh, the prototype that the rest of the story follows, the changing shield is an excuse. And then when he takes off his helmet, he still doesn't recognize him. And they haven't, unlike Gareth and Gawain, they haven't been apart for years. Like his face is damaged, but they just don't know who their friends are because that's harder than it seems. And it's also crucial. Um, and uh, the tragedies of the Arthurian court again and again come either literally or metaphorically from not knowing someone is a friend when they are. What's the role of the reader or audience in these lack of recognition scenes? We usually know. Um, one of the things that, like, uh, a great example of, um, I mean, the the reason I drew your attention to those uh, manuscript moments where there's an M instead of a Merlin is like, that feels to me like emblematic of uh, you as the reader need to be able to recognize that that M means Merlin, but it's kind of a wink to the reader, I think, that you know that it's Merlin, actually, but you recognize that you're supposed to kind of act like or pretend you don't know. In the same way, the story of Sir Gareth, um, we're told before the story starts that he's Sir Gareth. So there's no mystery for the reader ever, even though Mallory sometimes calls him Bowmanes for big chunks, Mallory calls him Bowmanes instead of Gareth. But the story is introduced as, like, next comes the story of Sir Gareth that was called Bowmanes. Uh, so before we start the story, we know that Gareth is Bowmanes. We know who they are. We know Gareth of Orkney. And Gareth of Orkney isn't a character who, as far as we know, he doesn't pre-exist Mallory. So we don't know, like, uh, 
Mallory's readers wouldn't necessarily be like, Gareth, I know who that is. But Gareth of Orkney, you would know who that is. Because the of Orkney uh, would be recognizably in Gawain's family. So like, I think we always, the readers always know who everyone is. Does recognition have a connection to trust? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I think that's a big part of like, like when I say Arthur doesn't know who his friends are, the the metaphor there is that Arthur doesn't know who he should trust. Um, and he trusts, sometimes he trusts the wrong person. And, and yeah, and that has disastrous results. Um, I think she's going to talk about it on Sunday. Michaela has a lot to say about who recognizes and who doesn't. Uh, so there are some people who are able to see through disguises and some people aren't. And I didn't really uh, talk about that. I hope I didn't talk about that much because uh, that's going to be what Michaela is talking about. Um, some people can see through the disguises. Some people can recognize people easily or are the first ones who recognize people and some people never do. And uh, that has something to do with trust and it has something to do with who they are. Arthur Scourt's definitely dangerous. Like <laughs> the other thing about like tournaments are uh extremely dangerous uh both arthur's court is dangerous like politically but also being a knight is all about violence and they're always fighting each other for fun and they frequently knights die in a tournament and those tournaments are also politically dangerous because if your brother or son or best friend is killed in a tournament um you are probably going to get uh, deadly vengeance against the knight who killed him, even though they both entered the tournament knowing that it's dangerous and they might die. But the vengeance that uh, the blood feuds and vengeance that come from deaths in tournaments are earnest. Um, absolutely, it's dangerous. <laughs> are there any other questions? Um, go ahead. Again, I'm like, so, uh, sad that the secret identity talk didn't happen this time um because uh, i think it would be i think it would be also bring an interesting like the connection between superhero stories and uh, medieval night stories is one that i'm really interested in personally the idea of making a name for yourself reminds me of some of the stories in the decameron uh yeah i mean yeah, for sure. Exiled characters hide their identity for safety, but eventually they show their nobility. Um, that is, it is a trope through. I, again, I think this is something that's definitely going to come up in Michaela's talk that uh, exiled characters, hidden characters, people uh, who aren't known, people who like there's uh, whole tropes of like babies who are taken away and are uh, not recognized for who they are until they're adults. I think all of that is going to definitely come up in Michaela's talk, which I'm very eager to hear about. Um, I, I'm going to try. I'm like in hopes of not stepping on uh, Michaela's toes. I'm going to like not talk about anything except Lamar Arthur. <laughs> but the, I'm eager for more conversation after her talk. Um, it does sound familiar for sure. Any last questions? In that case, um, thank you so very much for joining me. Uh, this was a lot of fun and I will uh, 
If you think of one, I'll be more than happy to answer it either on the Discord or in four hours or so when I'm back doing another live Q&A. All right. Thanks a lot.